We're going to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to the Eastside Freedom Library. I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-director here. Um, this is a project uh, tonight in collaboration with WAM. Delighted to have their involvement on this side of the river. And we'd love to see more of you over here more often. Um, hopefully you signed the guest book. Uh, there are restrooms downstairs. There is hot water for tea and cold water to drink. Sammy is disappointed that there isn't coffee. Um, sorry. Uh, but there is tea, and some of it is caffeinated, if that's what you're really looking for. I was looking for brown coffee to buy. Ah, take uh, with me. Uh huh. Yeah, we have only the beans. Yeah. Kind of supported. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have cookies from the cookie cart uh, here in the neighborhood, and um, hope you will avail yourself of some cookies before you go. We also. Um, with, we're, with our colleague Pat Darling, we popped up a book display today of books on Iraq and the Middle East and um, encourage you to take a look at them before you go. Um, we really do want uh, to offer layers of learning here at the library. So you hear a presentation, but there are also books that you can read uh, to learn more. Um, so, um, oh, I should, Two things I should say to begin with. One, that we like to recognize that this is land that belonged to Dakota people before they were driven out uh, by the US government. Um, and secondly, um, that this is a building that was paid for by the blood, sweat, and tears of immigrant iron miners, coal miners, and steel workers who made Andrew Carnegie the richest man in America in the early 20th century. So this is a so-called Carnegie um, library. Um, until we get to heaven, we won't know uh, if it got it in. <laughs> so, um, but we are dedicated to the intersections of labor, immigration, and social justice. And um, that's why we're here. So Marie is going to introduce Sammy and all yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, in case you're wondering about the cards that are on your chairs, uh, these are cards to Senators Klobuchar and Smith, asking them to support the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. We, WAM started a campaign a couple of years ago. Uh, the first year we sent 2,000 cards to Senator Franken and Senator Smith. We're doing another round. We want to send, an, or Senator Franken and Klobuchar, I'm sorry, and we want to do another round now to Senator Klobuchar and Senator Smith. We hope again to uh, send 2,000 cards. So if, you're in, if, if you read it and you agree and you'd like to sign it, we would appreciate it. You can just leave the cards there or throw them in the basket. They'll come around later. And we'll send them from WAM. We'll put the stamps on. We like to put, send them individually because they're a little more impressive. Since they're a, a form, you know, they're not they don't pay as much of attention as if they were individual. But at least if they come individually, that helps. The other thing we have is we have a um, petition to ban nuclear weapons. Many of you may already have signed it. If you sign it, have signed it, we ask that you not sign again because we're trying to be very careful not to have duplicates. I will pass this around and you can sign it, maybe you won't. Sammy is speaking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this and, and what Wam is doing when we give Sammy a break after he speaks. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about Sammy because I think many of you probably know him. Um, <clears throat> when his mom died back in 2003, right after the, shortly after the beginning of the Iraq War, his sister called him and said, Sammy, you have to come home. You're the oldest eldest brother in the family, and it's really important that you come home and you bury your mom. Uh, so Sammy went home, and he spent about a month there. He met his 40 nieces and nephews that he had not met before. And he came home, and he was, he just didn't feel right. 
He, he couldn't get his mind off a rock. He couldn't sleep, he couldn't work, um, he had trouble eating. So he said, I'm going back to a rock. I need to see what I can do to rebuild the relationship between my two countries, my country of origin and my country of choice. So in 2004, Sammy went back. He was going to spend five years in Iraq. He's still there. He's been there for over 15 years. Uh, when he left, we were very, very worried. We thought for sure he'd get killed over there. You know, the U.S. was still there. The war was still going on. Uh, but he has been safe, and uh, we are very happy to welcome him back every year. He's been coming back to Minnesota to talk about what's going on in Iraq for the last 15 years, and we're very happy to have him here again. Thank you, Sammy. Um, five years, but now it's about, okay. what, 15 years. Uh, of course, I got remarried, and I have now four kids. One is a stepson, and three uh, are 13, Omar and Roya, seven. And Isa, Jesus, the youngest, is six. <laughs> and actually, uh, people think those are my grandson. And I say, yes, but I made them. <laughs> it's safe in uh, Najaf, and uh, always I try to convince uh, one of my dearest friends who is attending here with his beautiful wife keep telling him, please come over. Uh, but someday, he said, someday I will be there. And I'm still waiting for him. But when I decided to go back, he probably doesn't remember this, but he told me, Sammy, the bridge that always you wanted to build between the US and Iraq has two ends. You get it to maintain both ends not only the Iraqis, please come back. So I remember the salmon. Salmon goes upstream, doesn't come back. So that's the only uncommon thing between Sammy and salmon, that I keep coming back. Peter, you know Iraqis drink tea, just like Afghani. Somali, like Indian, coffee, very little. But uh, we had this program less than, a little bit less than two years ago. We started it in Najaf. This program, we call it English for Reconciliation, where we invite Americans and British, because both they collaborated and invaded Iraq. So they come to teach English for 30 days but they don't drink their everyday coffee. So I made sure I bring coffee for them. And I bought two coffee makers, one at home and one at the school where they teach. So when I go back, I was looking for coffee to buy, actually, when I saw those samples. Uh, anyway. My friend Marie Brown has been always organizing my visit talks, visits to different places. And John, John Brown, her husband, was there always, driven us everywhere. John left us last November, while well, exactly a week later, my younger son here, Tariq, left too. But I feel their spirit here, they are here with us. They are present. Present. So let's celebrate their presence. In his last visit to the UK, United Kingdom, President Trump met the Queen. And 
ask us this question. How could possibly keep so beautiful political system and they pay your majesty? She goes, well, it's so easy. Just surround yourself with intelligent people, Donna. He goes, wow, intelligent people. And right away she rang a bell. And here, Theresa May, the former prime minister of England, of Britain. Yes, Your Majesty, how can I help you? Well, I have a question for you. Your parents gave a birth to a child. That child is not your son, I'm sorry, is not your brother, nor your sister. Who would be that child? And she goes, that's me. Excellent, Teresa, go back to work. Look at Trump and Trump goes, wow, that's impressive. His visit ended, he went back to Washington and the next morning, at the White House, in his office, rang the bell. And here's Pence, Michael Pence. Mr. President, how can I help you? Well, I have a question for you. Yeah. Your parents gave a birth to a child. That child is not your sister, nor your brother. Who would be that child? Yeah. Michael? Yeah. I don't know where I'm going. I don't well, this is really a good question, Mr. President. I'll be with the answer shortly. So he went out convened his cabinet members, addressed the question, no answer. Look at his watch, has been a while, he needs the answer. So he went to grab a sandwich, he saw Hillary Clinton sitting in the corner having her sandwich. <laughs> Hillary, I have a question for you. He answered the question. He thought she's Democrat. So she knows more. <laughs> and she goes, well, that's me, after she heard the question. And he runs to <laughs> Trump. Mr. President, I got the answer. <laughs> yes, Michael. Who would be? Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and Trump goes, no, you're absolutely wrong. It's Theresa May. <laughs> if the US, mainly Washington, in a mess these days, and you hear the news about the impeachment, they try to impeach the president, but there are lots of indications and signs that this person doesn't fit the job, and we deserve more. In comparison to what is going in Iraq, absolutely, the situation in Iraq is worse. Far worse. At least, <laughs> you have your basic public services. You have electricity uninterrupted. You have clean water. You have Clean air, oh, Minneapolis wow. I, or, or Minnesota always compete with Hawaii and, and health issue, which is the best. Either Hawaii or Minnesota is the first. So you kind of enjoying this beautiful life, but still there are 800 military bases across the world to keep you happy here. Maybe you're not involved directly, but you're paying for it. If Iraq is our subject today, so you paid for Iraq war. Taxes mainly. the main source to pay like an average $12 billion a month for the Iraq war. Joseph Stiglitz, he's an economist, put it in his book, The Cost of the War, three to four trillion dollars 
the war should be constant and it's still going on. I personally thought we learned a lot from George Bush era, who was elected twice. <laughs> now, are we going to elect Trump twice? Too? I mean, how, how did it happen that you, we said, we tried to justify that George Bush won the election once by some uh, foul play in, in Florida, I think, because his brother was the governor there. Then in Ohio. Now, Russia <laughs> is supposed to be, uh, was involved in uh, Trump. I mean, do you believe that? <laughs> yes? <laughs> now, is he coming back? Maybe, maybe not. But who will be there? I mean, always we have two parties, two political parties, either Democrats or Republicans. How come we don't have a third one or fourth one? We have more choices. This is what's going on in Iraq. Before the invasion, George Bush's administration went to New York and asked who are forming the Iraqi community there in Chicago, in London, and somewhere else, and gathered those street people, the Iraqi street who have who had no knowledge about how to run the country, and they brought them and sent them there. The question of Theresa May is really, it, it, it needs some little intelligence to, to, to solve it. But those Iraqis, they never, for example, Al-Maliki, you remember Al-Maliki. Al-Maliki was in Syria selling water beads and clay stones for the prayers. That's it. That's his knowledge. He had little shop where he sell those for the visitors who comes to Syria. Then Ibrahim Jafari, his partner in the Adawa party, political party, that guy was a failed eye doctor who started organizing trips to Mecca for pilgrims. To make all they knew. And others, I don't know them, Iraqi don't know them. Uh, the real intellectual Iraqis left the countries. They were threatened by their life not to be in the country. <coughs> so we have some numbers, unfortunately staggering and uh, alarming. For example, we have 35% of the population in Iraq, like such Iraq, it's, it's, the oil is uh, uh, flooding there. We have uh, from 2003 until 2014, $1 trillion, the revenue from oil alone. That's a lot of money. That's $1,000 billion in 11 years, but no sign of rebuilding Iraq. The lack of electricity is still on. They spent for electricity about $40 billion, but no improve. Mm -hmm. It's like it's, it's <laughs> something correct. The money is stolen, and the Iraqi government doesn't want to do it, just recently. A Chinese expert visited the country, met with the government, and he couldn't believe what they told him. He came out in a press conference, addressed the Iraqi. He said, I, with my team, I can solve the Iraqi electricity problem in six months. The cost is $4 billion. We don't want 
money, we want oil instead. And it's for 20 years. Not in six months, for 20 years. But I spoke and suggested this to the government. The government said no. And mentioning this, each Iraqi official, whether prime minister or all the ministers, they have in their offices so-called American advisor. Tell them what to do. <clears throat> so when the Iraqi official, like say the minister of oil, told that this Chinese expert, don't do it, not the Iraqi actually, the actor, the guy who sat there and told him what to do. Just like Malik in 2014, in June 10, 2014, when ISIS entered Mosul from the border, Syrian border, from Arraqqa, Al-Maliki ordered his, he was in chief of the uh, defense minister. He was the minister on behalf of. So he ordered the army to withdraw from Mosul. And that order was not his, but the person who was sitting and tell him what to do. Now, you may say why. In 2006, Condoleezza Rice announced that the U.S. will adopt a new policy, a new strategy called the constructive chaos. We will not side anymore with the tyrants, she said, or the dictators. We will topple them and get the situation in chaotic position and we be in control. So democracy will flourish gradually. But that never happened. You saw what happened in Syria and Iraq. They tried in Syria, but now in Yemen. So it's continuously letting Iraq, uh, Arabs killing each other in order to keep that jinni, the Arab Muslim jinni, in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Not to allow him to get out and flourish and be like the others. Because the time is not the Arab time, it's the Western time. Therefore, we don't have electricity. Without electricity, we cannot do anything. Wow. Students cannot do their jobs, probably. The doctors, nurses, and the <coughs> hospitals. I mean, 39 kinds of Diseases, that's unknown, unknown. But the top of that is cancer, birth defects, hepatitis A, B, and C. Hepatitis A, B, because of lack of drinkable water. At my home, this is to <coughs> make you feel good. When you come and visit, we have our O system, reverse osmosis system, where we uh, purify the water. And our organization, Muslim Peacemaker Teams, helped to build about one and six water filtration system and 106 buildings where schools rotate in three shifts, or at least two shifts, to attend that. So we made with help of, of course, generous people who participated in different states, in different cities of the US to buy these equipments and build them in the school to enable the kids not to get sick with hepatitis A, B, and C. But the job was not only to buy them, but we have to maintain them. So we're doing that. I have a list that Human Rights Watch produced it last year. It's a kind of a report about the situation in Iraq. I read it quickly, but not all of it. 
uh, I touched some area. It said 3 million and 400 Iraqis has left Iraq as refugees and migrants and get scattered in 46, uh, 64, I'm sorry, 64 countries. This never happened in the history of Iraq. They were forced to leave their country because of a situation, it's a hard situation, continuous violence, continuous, continuous wars, and the light at the end of the tunnel is, is not there, so they have the money, either they went in a form of migration, they use their money to travel, or just file an asylum application at the um, those UN offices, whether in the neighboring countries, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Turkey, too. There are four million and hundred thousand displaced persons inside of Iraq. Out of those, most of them got some relatives, went and, and, and uh, lived with them. But the kids lost their schools, lost their neighborhoods, their classmates, their friends, their cities, and they lived in, in, as a burden with their relatives or friends. And some of them got hosted in mosques and schools. Two. One million of those displaced persons and 700, like almost two millions, they live still in tents and camps poorly. And they shouldn't. I mean, this should not be in Iraq. Iraq is a rich country. Iraq, uh, if you think of one of those Arab Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, Kuwait, they, they live lavishly. Iraq, too, is also one of the Gulf uh, countries and rich in oil. And Iraq is more rich than Kuwait and Emirates. Maybe he, Iraq will be after Saudi Arabia when Saudi Arabia uh, done with the oil. There are five millions and six hundred thousand orphans. Their ages between one month and seventeen years old. Two millions of widows, ages between fifteen and fifty-two. So. This is some, some of, I'm, I'm not going to continue. I just want to mention the hope that we are hanging by this hope. And every time we have a new born child, that's hope. That's a new morning. That's a new beginning. And with that, birth, <laughs> whether it's your brother or your sister, that's the joke. But with each birth, there is a life, and that's our hope. And as member of Muslim Peacemaker Teams, I thought of the sister city agreement we signed and got it on place between Minneapolis and Najaf, Najaf where I was born. Minneapolis is my hometown by choice. Try to invest on in this, capitalize on this, and usually sister city program is two-way streets. Mm -hmm. It was in the beginning, but not anymore. They don't allow Iraqis to come to the US. It's true that Trump excluded Iraq from the ban list Muslim ban list excluded Iraq, but internally, like when I met the ambassador of the US to Iraq last year, complaining why Iraqis cannot get visa, he said, Sami, it's true that Iraq is excluded, but we get our instruction from the State Department 
telling us every day, don't give Iraqi Muslim visa. Don't. And I told him, based on what? He said, out of 100, every day they apply. Either they get three or not. And those three, they have really strong reason. We have to investigate and find those they have strong reason. No. Is there any opposite? He said, die. The Swedish people, we give 97 visa. And those are three, we don't give them because their origin from Iraq. <laughs> but they, they carry Swedish passport. So it's so grim. Then I told them, you're talking about banning Muslim, but Saudi Arabia, when we go to schools here, the colleges and private uh, English, <laughs> we see more than 30%, up to 50% are Saudi students. Right. And one from Spain, one from Turkey, the other from uh, South America, or Iran sometimes, but mostly Saudi. He said, he completed. He said, Saudis, we give them 10 years visa. None question. And those, like, uh, exception, and we have uh, our own agreements. So <clears throat> don't waste your time. Iraqis, they cannot go to the US. All right, we, I explained to him the, uh, the, the program that we're doing it, and we're still doing it. Instead of, I said, two ways became one way. So that hope, we are, we are hanging by that hope that when our American friends come to Najaf, it would be their lifetime impact. Definitely, the 22 Americans who came to Najaf and stayed at least a month their life changed, and when they come here, they talk about it. And just recently, uh, when I came, I had a student from State College, the Penn State University in Iraq. He stayed a month, then we flew back. He went to his college. His professor invited me to speak to his students. They were about 700. 20 students, not this Thursday, but Thursday on the 19th. I spoke to them, and 10% they came to the podium, picked up the materials, the flyers, and they are attending to come to visit. 70 of them, young. So that's success. I mean, the more we widen this circle to accept the Iraqis, Iraqis accept Americans, not Canadians. Be careful, when you go there, don't change your, or shy away from your identity, tell them, um, no, tell them I'm American, and see how they react. <clears throat> this type of generosity, it's not about food or shelter when they provide you. The generosity, despite what happened to them, they tell it, welcome, when they see you civilian, as civilian, not them, and you know. And that kind of generosity is the highest form of nonviolence, the highest form of peacemaking. That way, we are in this thing. So thank you so much. I'll take a break and come back to some questions. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple other announcements I wanted to make. One is that on um, the 12th of October, in solidarity with Rage Against the War Machine in Washington, D.C., we are having an event called Stop Landless Wars. It will be a demonstration at Lake Street and Nicollet in Minneapolis. I'm going to hope you'll all come and support it. There are some flyers back on the table. Um, also, 
I'm going to pass these cards around. You take as many as you like. If you have friends, uh, or if you'd like to leave some at your church or take them to your school, leave them in your library. A friend of Wham, Thomas, Tom White, makes up these cards every year, and it talks about the U.S. military spending and how we should be spending our money instead of spending it on the military. So they're very useful little cards to have in your pocket and to talk about why we should not be spending so much money on the military and be putting it into our schools and to, uh, you know, all kinds of other good things and health programs and, and the things that we really need to help the people of our country. The other thing I wanted to uh, mention to you, Sammy talked about his English for Reconciliation program. I have some, there are six page uh, explanations. I'm going to pass them around. I have a few, and there's some on the back table. Just take one if you are interested and pass them on. And there's more back there if you, if you are interested and you don't get one. Um, where's Kristen? Where's Kristen? I want to introduce her. <laughs> uh, Kristen was here a minute ago. And uh, she brought the cards up here. Anyway, Kristen is the director of WAM, and we love her. She does a wonderful, wonderful job. She's been around the peace movement for years and years. Kristen, <laughs> come on up here. You're hiding. Okay. And also, I wanted to thank Peter for inviting us over here yeah, and being you, very, very generous in allowing us to take up a collection. Because you know they are, they survive on donations here too, so most of the time when people come, the collection that's taken up is for the library. Uh, but Peter said it was okay this time if we had a collection uh, to support Sammy's work. So we're going to be passing around the basket, and you can throw your cards in there. And if you throw in a check, we would greatly appreciate it. If you write a check, you make it out to the Twin City Peace Campaign. TCPC, and I've got a small account. I deposit the checks and then I give Sammy the cash. Because, you know, they don't have a banking system besides everything else that they're lacking. They don't have a banking uh, system over there, you know, to cash check. I can't give them a check to eat cash and, and over there. Or, so, um, anyway, uh, I make them out to my organization. You make them out to my organization and then I'll cash them for him. And, he carries every, all the donations he gets back to Iraq in cash. So thank you so very much for any support that you can give Sammy. And again, thank you for being here. And Sammy, you're ready to yes. Okay. Peter, I must say, this is a really beautiful library. Mm -hmm. I've never seen library like yeah. It's an artistic. Uh, I mean, are you behind all this beautiful uh, murals on the wall? And, you know? <coughs> Lots of people. Nice. Lots of people. Nice. Yes. When you talked last time in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, you talked about Israel's bombardment of Iraq. I wondered if you could go into that a little more. Yeah, um, I was surprised the American officials first time uh, confirmed that Israel used its regular defense air to bomb several sites in Baghdad and in Bala. This is north of. Uh, right after that, Netanyahu himself admitted said, you, yes, we did, because Iran has no immunity for their missiles that they smuggled through Iraq to Syria or to Hezbollah, to Lebanon. In the past, I spoke about this, the Israeli involvement. And of course, without Israel admission or the U.S. Department uh, uh, of, uh, uh, confirming that my 
Kirk was not founded or backed by, by uh, uh, these two countries. But always we thought of this, like beginning of the war, there were, at the same time, two mosques get bombed between two neighborhoods, one Shia and one Sunni. So when they get bombed, right away, the Shia thinks the Sunni had did that, and the Sunni thing, the Shia bomb there. So they got in a fight, and that fight, uh, the circle of that fight, uh, uh, got widened, 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 until the whole country uh, got in a civil war for, for many years. But at that time, also, people thought the garbage dumpsters from there was, yeah, you know, like the source of the explosion. And the other said, no, a suicide bombers. And the third was said, no, it's a plane. But actually those drones, you can hear them, you cannot see them. They are way, way, way up. They send their bombs, whether they are American or Israelis or any other countries, but always America in control of that air, and today too. So they facilitate the Israeli planes to come and bomb uh, those sites. This is after, uh, like, uh, since ISIS was ended, and we said, okay, ISIS is done, and now we are uh, safe. No more bombs, no more war, no more exploding, and Right away, we, we heard of this, and, and people paid the price. Many of them got killed. The Israeli involvement, of course, to secure their uh, safety, security for many years, that to strip away the Arab countries from their main army. So we have no armies anymore. Even the Syrian army got weakened because it got beaten up for many years of so-called ISIS or the uh, al Nusra and those opposition who wanted to change the regime, but always the US is there and Israel is there too. This Arab Spring is not actually an Arab Spring, tend to be deadly, and but Spring for whom? Definitely for Israel. How about Arab hell? There you go. Now you are getting creative. <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, we think when it comes to the core of the problem, it is the struggle and the fight and the instability between Palestinians and the Israelis. We would like to see a solution to this. Israel is there to be there. The Palestinians are there to be there. The US is there to be there. Iraq is there to be there. You cannot finish each other. You have to be wise. You have to be uh, fair and humane when you treat each other. So force today probably won't last. The Iranian also, we think, bombed Aramco in Saudi Arabia just a few days ago, probably a week, more than a week ago. And until now, there is no reaction from Saudis or the US toward Iranian. What does that mean? I mean, if you can do this, so the others can do the same or more the violence, the attack, the assault. So uh, I think peace is cheaper, peace is better, peace should be the solution. 
And for me, <coughs> my name is Sammy Samuel, a uh, Semitic name. So we're cousins. And before we are cousins, we are brothers and sisters. We are humans, and we deserve better, better life. And there is so much on this earth, enough for everyone. Yes. yes. You started off talking a little bit about infrastructure. Um, is there, is it the U.S. that refuse to commit to rebuilding like the electrical grid and and then the corruption that prevents you know scale projects that would bring some economy and development and, and human comfort there are 12 u.s military bases in iraq today and the job of those forces to keep the status quo as it is, maybe worse. I tried to relate what's going on to that genie in the bottle. So if Iraq is a stable, there will be growth. There will be rebellion. I mean, there will be work. The people are not less than others intellectually or in, by the intelligence. Uh, the people, uh, remember, Iraq is the cradle of civilization. Uh, Iraq has everything, never got humiliated, humiliated, humiliated in the history because they have these two rivers and more than 40 million palm trees. I mean, dates is, is very nutritious fruit. When the sanction after 91 war, that the first Gulf War, uh, took place. Sanction against Iraq was applied from that date until 2003. During that era, if you remember Albright, Madeleine Albright, when she made the comment that Ira Iraqi children died about half a million of them, it's worth it just to keep Saddam Hussein uh, Control. So, 5,000 kids died a month at that time. Was worth it in the view of Madeleine Albright. So, actually, in the view of the uh, Bush's administration. Um, continuing this now, by the effect of usage, depleted uranium, we have lots of uh, uh, birth defects, and also the cancer and other uh, diseases. So th that's what it meant. I mean, surprisingly, <laughs> the population of Iraq today is the same as population in Canada, with the difference in the size of the land. Uh, the deep population of the Arab world is not working. The demographic factor is a still a threat to be like the Arabs to be there. You cannot silence them, you cannot kill them, you cannot finish them. They are there. So again, uh, I think the only th reason the U.S. is in, in in Iraq or in that area, Middle East, because of the natural resources. That's it. And Iraqis are ready to give up their oil just to be left alone. Wow. Yeah. Have the Chinese come and made any offers? We'll build you this. You mentioned uh, the I, trading oil. Yeah, I, China. I. Uh, I met an official at the uh, MSF, MSP airport today because uh, the 
airport in Negev uh, established in 2009 is growing and they need help in training and uh, expanding uh, their facilities. So I carried a message from the CEO of Negev, of Airport Negev, to the CEO here. So I met, I told them why the Turks, the German, the Chinese are in Iraq helping to rebuild the country, but none of Americans are there. And according again to the sister city agreement, I told them I would like to see more American are involved to rebuild the country, to trust each other, and to do that. And I told them about what we're doing in terms of uh, the, the program one come up, came up with, like the English for Reconciliation, he liked it. And I invited him to come, uh, uh, not to, to do business. I mean, the economic sense should be at least, well, Trump is always bragging about the economy and money, and he goes there, bring money from Saudis, Tom, why don't you come and take some money from Iraqis? Just have some projects uh, accomplished. And we say, well, uh, things are getting better. But the absence of American is amazing in Iraq. Not the military. We have 12 military bases. But we need more civilians. We need more uh, educators, doctors, and builders. Because um, I was wondering about Iraqis we build in Iraq. Is it there are there are not enough builders? What happened oh. in Mosul is just horrendous. Yeah, they, they do. They do. They do. I mean, they uh, repair their homes and uh, build simple homes and yeah. But we need schools, real schools. We need hospitals with their facilities. Uh, we need communications. The communications been destroyed many times. The uh, um, bridges destroyed, the, the highways, we don't have highways except one, I mean, in the whole country that uh, it's link, it links uh, Basra by the north, that's it, or by the east side. The north is kind of separated. Isn't that because of the bombs we dropped in there? Because when Saddam Hussein was in, just everything was fine in Iraq. And then we yes. claimed there were ma yes. weapons of mass yes. destruction. Carpet, there were, there were not. Bombing. But carpet we bomb. bombed the hell out of it. Right. It's, it's, yes. uh, the, yes. Our tax dollars paid to do this, yes. which is not acceptable. Yes. It's like Eisenhower warned the military industrial complex. So it's not acceptable what we did in Iraq. There's no excuse for it. Very good. By the way, I made four, uh, I was telling my friends, we had cooked dinner before the talk. I made four trips to Somalia last year. And we defied, we were defying uh, Trump's uh, decision that make us uh, or put us in the, in the ban list. So those ban list T, which is Somalia and Iraq, went get together and did some business together. So, and we assured uh, others that we are capable to do some business between us and, and sign some agreements for rebuilding in. So we had sister city agreement with Bursaso in the north and Portland and another uh, sister city agreement with Hergeza and Somalia. I was last uh, July, in, not this July, last year, 2008, in, in Mogadishu too. So people working and uh, helping their families, uh, they are busy to earn their living, so just like other people. And many, many animals. They have goats and uh, sheep and lots of camels. I had today my lunch at Hamdi restaurant, so one of the Somali restaurants had some goats. 
But in, in Somalia, they don't have butcher uh, or meat shops because meat's everywhere walking with us. And you see some phone numbers on the bodies. The other uh, day, there, uh, uh, a goat gave birth to a baby. And uh, that goat, the mother, had the number of the owner at, at her body. So they called the owner to come and take care of both the mother and the baby. So this is how they are humane and, and take care of the, not only the, I mean themselves, but also the animals. I just wanted to ask, is the Somali government the kind of government that the United States wants? Instead of what, I thought the Islamic um, court system was what Somalians wanted, which Al-Shabaab was connected, was connected to. Is that true? Al-Shabaab and ISIS and Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda yeah, before. That, but I thought the Islamic courts is what Somalis wanted originally. But the government that's in Somalia now is what the United States government wants there, correct? It depends which government, but uh, I know uh, Saudi Arabia tried to control, with, with the Emirates, they tried to control the Somalia. They are provinces now. I think they are about seven provinces. And uh, those seven provinces, I haven't been in all of them. I have been in only three. So uh, Saudis are playing really dirty games with them. So they don't buy their product when, only when they need it. Like during the hard they buy the uh, livestock from. But regular uh, year, months of the year, they don't. And, uh, but Iraq is getting involved now in trying to. Uh, Saudis want them to have support in the war in Yemen. And they said, no, we don't get involved in it. Just like Oman, Qaboos, if you know. Oman is not involved in this, neither Kuwait. Only two countries are doing the dirty work in, in the Arab world. Or two Bs, uh, Ben Salman and Ben Zayed. Ben Zayed the uh, son of Muhammad, Muhammad bin Zayed, who is the son of uh, the previous uh, president of UAE. And bin Salman is the son of the king. Uh, he's the crown prince of uh, Saudi Arabia today. They are doing really bad things. Well, we can have tea and cookies and visit. And Thank you. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, hot water, tea, beautiful uh, grapes, green grapes, <laughs> giant grapes. <laughs> Please enjoy yourself. I just ask you one question. How can we make international peace? How, well, how, how, how can we fix it? Because yeah. it's our tax dollars paying yeah. this, but how can we make a future for the children? Yeah. You, need, you need first inner peace within yourself. See, I, when, when, I the, I yeah, when, when the war started in Iraq, the invasion, I felt like and the Americans started to war within me against Sami the Iraqis. So to, to uh, fix that, I thought I should go there and start the peace peace movement. And also it needs to be peaceful with your wife, your husband, your kids at home. And you will be a perfect example. I mean, there should be uh, something to radiate out of you to affect others, and that's called peace. Well, I just, so, yeah. uh, I don't see a future for the children in this world yeah. if we don't stop these crazy wars right. because they're right. not right. There was uh, a young man from Britain, Xavier. He called me, he said, Sammy, I'm very much interested to come into Iraq and, and teach. I told him, great. So I sent him the application, he filled it up, he got the visa. Then his mother, who works in Qatar as a teacher, told him, no, you, go, you don't go to Iraq. We hear all this news about uh, the bombing in Iraq, you don't go to Iraq. He said, Sammy, I'm sorry, I cannot come because uh, 
uh, my mother not on board with me. So he asked me, do you suggest anything? I go, well, I'm not going to write your mother, but I'll let all those visitors who came to Iraq and participate to write your mother. So one of them is Greta Hughes, one of those uh, activists who uh, came in a boat to Gaza, the first boat that was uh, attacked by Israelis and killed several of them. So she sent a letter and told, told the mother, the mother uh, named Natalie Rochelle, something like, she told her, I am in agreement with you 100%. If I have a son 18 years old, I would not send him to San Francisco. <laughs> because of the shooting that going on. It's not safe. So she got convinced the mother and told the son, okay, now you can go. <laughs> Yes, please. I'd like to thank you and um, uh, I wish you long life. Thank you.